Welcome to the Heart of Innovation, 60 minutes that could save life and limb with new breakthrough ideas and innovation changing the healthcare landscape. Brought to you by patient advocacy group, thewaytomyheart.org. In partnership with Cardiovascular System Incorporated's patient advocacy campaign, Take a Stand Against Amputation. Here are your hosts for the Heart of Innovation, Emmy Award-winning journalist and founder of The Way to My Heart, Kim McNicholas, and interventional cardiologist and founder of the Save My Piggies Health Education Series, Dr. John Phillips. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. Today, we are talking about innovation around ALS. Most are familiar with it now more than ever because of the famous internet ice bucket challenge involving the pouring of a bucket of ice water over a person's head, either by another person or even self-administered to promote awareness for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or ALS. ALS is a progressive nervous system disease that affects nerve cells in the brain and spinal cord causing loss of muscle. And most people with the disease begin with muscle stiffness or weakness, and then the muscle paralysis spreads to vital organs um, such as the lungs. People lose the ability to walk, to dress, to write, to speak, even to swallow, ultimately to breathe. And We're going to explain why we are talking about it here on the Heart of Innovation coming up in a moment, but I'm going to introduce everyone who's here. Of course, everyone knows uh, my co-host, Dr. John Phillips. Hello. How are you, Kim? And we also have Kearney Gray. He's the Director of Development for the Gleason Foundation, founded by former NFL New Orleans Saints football great Steve Gleason, who has ALS. Hey, Kearney, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Catherine Walker is here. She's Revitalist CEO. Um, they're a series of mental well-being treatment centers. Say hi, Catherine. Hey. And of course, nice to be here. <laughs> and of course, dietitian Melissa here is here. She's a registered dietitian at dietitianmelissa.com. Thank you so much, Melissa, also for being here. Thank you for having me. So we have a great discussion. We'll remind you who everyone is as we go along, but we always start our show with an inspiring quote. Dr. John Phillips, you have something to make us ponder? Well, I mean, I, we're going to be obviously talking about ALS and the Gleason Foundation. So it's apropos to have a quote from, from Steve Gleason himself, and he's got a lot of them. Uh, I have two. The first one was, and I think it's important when we talk about a disease that you basically lose control of everything. And then, you know, how do you combat a disease that you can't cure? And I'm really excited about about this show, but Steve said, we all face adversity and tragedy and need inspiration and motivation to keep rolling. And then the other thing that he said, I believe, and Kearney, correct me if I'm wrong, but when he started the the foundation or, or around that time, he said, no white flags. And I think he's got that tattooed somewhere. So he doesn't give up. Uh, you guys don't give up. And, and particularly when we talk about peripheral arterial disease and some of the vascular issues on the show that we've talked about in the past, uh, we don't give up. Our patients don't give up either. So thanks. Uh, thanks for joining us, Kearney. It's going to be a great show. Yeah, that's our team motto is no white flags for sure. Love it. It's oh, awesome. that's amazing. What does he say? I mean, I'm just curious because with ALS, it's been known if you Google it, we always have a problem with Dr. Google, right? Where it says the prognosis is three to five years, maybe tops. And here's Steve going on and he's what, at 10 or 11 years and he's thriving. Um, yeah, so, well, he, one of his other quotes is, you know, there isn't a cure for ALS. So until that time, technology is my cure. And that is um, technology and innovation is something that we pride and do well. Um, and it's it's allows people with ALS uh, the opportunity to live longer and live more productive. So, Does he talk about any sort of way in which um, he's able to keep his mind focused? It's so hard, I think, with ALS in particular that it is one of those chronic illnesses. You know the direction to go. Everyone seems to go in that direction. It's just a matter of, you know, how long you can put off some of the, you know, I, you know, symptoms that end up um, taking you on that downward spiral. How does he keep his mind focused and have hope, you know, to keep going and keep going and not worrying about tomorrow? Well, first, he's just a, a, a special person. And I don't say that even just from because I work for the foundation. Like, he's truly inspiring. I mean, it is not an easy life to live with ALS for anyone. Um, 
And he, one, he, he was, he's a very um, spiritual person, very holistic, um, and is very driven on his own um, to do the things he wants to do. He loved to travel. He loved to do these things. He didn't want to stop. The biggest thing, his biggest driver is his family. Um, he found out when he got diagnosed that he and his wife were, were pregnant and he wanted to see his, his child, his son grow up. And that yes. is one of his biggest um, driving forces in, in this. And then they ended up being able to have a, a second kid. Um, and uh, she's, you know, his oldest is 10 and, and she's about three and she's a pistol. And, and he drives them around in their wheelchair on his wheelchair and he takes walks and he, and he picks him up and goes to games and he does all these things that probably he wouldn't be able to do if it not be for the technology that he uses. So um, that is, I would say, his biggest driving force from a, um, you know, productivity standpoint. Yeah, I always want to wonder just what keeps people going because there's so much information out there that can literally just bring you down. I know nurse practitioner K has chronic inflammatory issues and really it is as well for you. It's it's your grandbabies, it's your husband, it's that family unit that really keeps you going as well. 100%. Without family and friends, um, you go down the rabbit hole. I think we've discussed that on previous occasions. Um, and it's family and friends and wanting to be here to see my grandchildren grow that keeps me motivated. So I completely understand. I know, Catherine, with the Revitalist, the, well, the mental wellness treatment centers, um, is there anything in particular, whether someone has ALS or another chronic illness, as you know, we um, move forward, is there anything that the family can say or shouldn't say when someone has a chronic illness like this? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, sorry, my internet connection is kind of weird right now. I'm at a veteran retreat. Um, so, uh, but yeah, no, you know, I think the piece with family members is, is learning um, to be in the moment with the person instead of trying to give them advice. Um, you know, cause so many times we look online and we think we're trying to be helpful. Um, but really what we're trying to do is we're just giving them sometimes just hope or even false hope because some of the treatments that are out there, they're not even accessible, right? So family members, you know, if they can just sit with the person in the moment, learn to live in the present and accept every day as it is, then that helps the, the person a lot, you know, to where it can help alleviate a lot of those fears of the future. It's so interesting you say that because we have our friend, Liz, we've been talking about the past two shows that just had um, open heart surgery and his brother, Grady, who is actually just uh, coming online right now to join us on the show and possibly chime in later. But he's it's really he took away his phone because so many of Douglas's friends were jumping on and trying to solve his problems and offer advice. And Grady's like, you know what? You don't need this right now. People just need it in the moment. They need to give you hope. They need to inspire you. And even most importantly, make you laugh. Distract you. Laughter is a great medicine. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Well, coming up right here on the Heart of Innovation, we're going to get into the heart of ALS and the innovation happening in this space that is helping patients to live better quality, longer life. So stay with us. You don't want to miss it. Leg health can indicate risk for heart attack, stroke, and amputation. If you have leg pain or cramps while walking, get checked for peripheral artery disease, or PAD. PAD is plaque buildup in mainly the leg arteries. Be sure to ask your physician for an ankle brachial index, also called an ABI test, where they use blood pressure cuffs to analyze the blood pressure in your legs. If they discover you have arterial plaque that's limiting blood flow to your feet, medicine and a regimented walking program are frontline treatment. If PAD is in its advanced stages, your physician may schedule a surgical intervention. Minimally invasive tools are available to remove plaque and restore blood flow, including cardiovascular system's Diamondback 360 atherectomy system, which sands away plaque that is a hard calcium. It's important to discuss all options with your physician, and if told you have no options, get a second opinion. Take a stand against amputation. For more information, go to standagainstamputation.com. That's standagainstamputation.com. Welcome back to The Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. 
Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Today we're talking about amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, otherwise known as ALS. You might remember ALS just basically because of a famous internet ice bucket challenge involving the pouring the bucket of the ice water over someone's head, either by themselves or someone else to raise awareness for ALS. It did a great job raising a lot of money actually for research of a very important drug that's been critical um, in slowing the progression of disease. But ALS is a progressive nervous system disease that affects those nerve cells. And you might be wondering, well, why are we talking about it here on the heart of innovation? Well, there are three main reasons that I was thinking about. One, although it's not considered a vascular disease, some research do, some researchers do believe that an ALS-linked gene mutation could cause disruptions in the blood spinal cord barrier, causing the neurovascular inflammatory response, which is ALS. Um, number two, due to the lack of mobility as ALS progresses, many people with ALS end up with circulation issues in the legs. Circulation issues in the legs is known as peripheral vascular disease. And we've talked about that at length on this show where arteries start hardening and the flaps that help usher blood flow back to the heart start malfunctioning in the veins as well. And number three, um, I'm really impressed with the innovation around treatment and disease management um, that has led to longer, better quality of lives you know, for these patients, especially by organizations such as the Gleason Foundation, founded by former New Orleans Saints NFL great Steve Gleason. And we have Kearney Gray. He's the director of development for the Gleason Foundation here with us to talk about patient-driven innovation around improving care. And thank you again for being here. We also have Catherine Walker. She's going to talk about the mental um, well-being for people with ALS and innovation around that. And also dietitian Melissa is here to talk about innovation around nutrition, especially in advanced stages. So um, Dr. Phillips, you want to kick things off with um, a conversation with uh, Kearney? Yeah. So, you know, Kearney, I was thinking about what, the, well, there was that um, news blurb that just came out. I think the ice bucket challenge raised upwards of a hundred million dollars and it helped develop a new drug that that may prolong uh, life expectancy in these patients. I know it's a small sample size, but it's it's a start, right? So, I mean, you guys in the Gleason Foundation have have you, you understand that this at present is not a disease that we can cure. But as as you had mentioned earlier in the show, you know you can live through the technology development. So, so I guess take us into the brain trust of the Gleason Foundation and and how you guys are innovating, whether it's with IT or you know, policy changes or, or working with medical um, devices and companies and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. So thank you. And, and again, happy to be here. Um, appreciate the time. Um, yeah, the Ice Bucket Challenge was definitely one of those uh, moments that just went viral. And it really did bring a ton of awareness for ALS across the world, um, really, which was great because ALS is one of the more underfunded uh, diseases, especially neurological um, and so that really did help influx of dollars into the research side of things, which just uh, one of the companies, and there's a number of them out there that are developing drugs uh, to slow the progression. Um, Amalex is the current one that just got FDA approval, uh, which is very exciting for the ALS community. Um, and it is estimated to slow that progression uh, anywhere from a year to maybe three at this point. Um, and, and obviously, they'll, they'll continue to monitor that. Um, that only brings what we do from the Team Gleason Foundation um, even more important because our goal is to help people live with this disease. We are not a, a foundation that supports research. Um, and that's not to say we don't want that to happen. It's just not our, it's not our mission. It's not what we try to do. Um, Steve founded this foundation uh, with his wife, Michelle, um, on the premise of um, there is no cure for ALS yet, so technology can be my cure. And so um, that is what we do. We, we improve life for people living with ALS by delivering as much innovative technology and equipment as possible and providing that improved life experience, that productivity that people lose. Another quote Steve loves and, and is, is said is, um, what ALS takes away, technology can give back and almost to some extent, that's a cure in itself uh, for someone who wants to live uh, with ALS and move forward and see that they can live a productive lifestyle. Um, and so that is that is our mission. We have um, thousands of people. We are not. We work in all fifty states. We ship equipment to. We have loaner closets. Um, <clears throat> you know, we have 
a system on our website where ALS patients come and they can um, submit grants and, and requests for different items, different things they need. We have a speech language pathologist on and an occupational therapist that are on our staff and they're working directly with the patients, whether in, in our office, in our assistive technology lab that we created um, oh, wow. or, or virtually. Yeah, we have we created a whole lab. It's really a, the only one in Louisiana and in the Gulf South, to my knowledge. There's some around the country as well, but um, they're, they're few and far between. So we use that as innovative space. We use that as teaching people who come into our office how to use equipment, home automation, the speaking devices. So it, it's very... Um, it's you know really something, and honestly, we need to expand it because it's it's grown. Can you can you give us an example of a a, a symptom or a, a problem that comes with ALS? Let's talk about, for example, they lose the ability to speak. Right, the there's the muscles they can't speak, and so that's catastrophic for somebody. So you guys what partnered with Microsoft and other companies to create the ability for these patients to to speak again, or at least use their own words or, or their own voice too. Is that right? That's right. We have a, so it's, it's, it's a large, right? So we do, a, we have a large voice banking program, right? So people can come and apply, they bank their voice. And then you don't sound like Stephen Hawking, if, if you recall how his robotic voice sounded, right? It sounds something very similar to you. And that, that when Steve did it to where it is now is exponentially better, you know, obviously technology is always advancing. Um, but that's a huge, a huge component to someone, especially to the spouse or the family members that can hear them. Um, that's really powerful. And we have a whole program. It's one of our, it's our second largest requested uh, item. Um, or it's not technically an item, but our other is, is a seat elevation. Um, and, I'll, and I'll get to the speaking devices as well, but the seat elevator is, is just what it sounds. It's, it's, a, it's an elevation device that doesn't come standard on, a, on one of the big power wheelchairs and it's not covered by insurance. And we take for granted being able to speak to somebody eye to eye when we're standing up and having a conversation. We take for granted being able to reach the countertop. And, you know, so as you mentioned, someone might lose their voice first and be able to go play golf. Um, mm -hmm. I've, it could be the other way around where someone has dexterity in their arms, but they don't in their legs, right? And they can't move. But the seated elevator, they can be, have a hobby. They can cook. They can reach the microwave. They can come up. They can, there's a YouTube video that we posted not too long ago um, that we're trying to help get seat elevation um, past um, a law to, to have it covered by Medicare. Um, so that it's, it's a very large expense to us. We could then divert those dollars into something else. Um, but it also helps people have access to that very productive element. And it's just, it seems like a small thing, but it's very big. Um, so we've been really working hard on, on the advocacy side of that. And that's what we did and were successful in with um, the speaking devices. They were originally not covered by insurance. And so someone loses their ability to speak and, there's, and they don't have the funds. There's no way for them to communicate. And that is, you know, you know no one, typically people aren't going to want to have the drive if they can't communicate with their family members or, or care team or doctors um, and so we were able to help get that law passed uh, with the help of, of uh, advocacy and our congressmen and senators who supported it. And it was passed into law as the Steve Gleason Act. Um, That's amazing. But it, it's so interesting. And I, I have a couple of questions in here. You know, when companies innovate, you mentioned it was it was Microsoft that you went to that really kicked <clears> things <throat> off. I mean, how is it? How big is ALS? If you don't have mass market for some of these large companies, how do you get them? Or how did Steve get them? Was it because of his fame? And, you know, he kind of put it out there and said, hey, you got to do something here. Or is it is ALS a big enough market for these huge corporations to innovate around? That's a great question. Um, first of all, it happened where we we team Gleason hosted a summit in New Orleans, uh, an accessibility summit, and challenged, you know, they were a number of groups and they were all talking about this and these things they can do. And Steve was getting frustrated because they, they weren't, it wasn't what he was hoping for, right? And he said, no, we have challenges, we need solutions. And he challenged everyone there to, Steve at the time was, was losing his ability to speak well. He was losing his ability to um, move. And so 
he wanted to not just speak better and have and have his voice sound like him. He wanted to drive his wheelchair with his eyes. So what we did was really Microsoft really, really helped us with was the iDrive technology that did not exist at all. And within a year, Microsoft helped we, with our help. We created this this technology that allows Steve with his device, with his eyes to com- to control his wheelchair on his own. No one else has to do it for him. That was very important for him to remain independent in, in that way. So that is a lot of what we do, productivity and independence so that people have that that drive and that, that ability to want to move forward. I think kind we're gonna... of right here. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> the fear of silence. I'm coming up right now on the heart of innovation. We'll have more with Kearney Gray with the Gleason Foundation and more innovation around ALS. So stay with us. My symptoms started with leg pain and leg cramps while walking. Me too, with a tightness in my calves. Well, do you know, my doctor thought that my leg cramps were a side effect of the statin he prescribed me. Well, my doctor just brushed them off as another symptom of old age. Mine thought the pain was radiating from my spine. My doctor blamed my neuropathy on diabetes until I got a wound on my foot that just wouldn't heal. Yeah, it turns out we all have peripheral artery disease, also known as PAD. It's plaque buildup mainly in the leg arteries causing poor circulation. For me, the diagnosis came too late and I lost my leg, but that does not have to happen to you. No, it does not because there are treatment options available if you're diagnosed early enough. PAD peripheral artery disease. If you've been experiencing leg pain, leg cramps, or neuropathy when walking, and your doctor isn't hearing you, we are. We are the way to my heart, the largest support network for peripheral artery disease patients, and we want to help you get back on your feet again. Visit our website at thewaytomyheart.org or call our LegSaver hotline, 415-320-7138. Your life and limb could depend on it. Welcome back to the Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We're continuing our conversation about innovation regarding chronic diseases that uh, you know ultimately have no cure. We talk about peripheral arterial disease. We treat the symptoms. We, we don't have a cure for it, and, and we've kind of stepped over the bridge now a little bit or onto another disease, ALS, and, and we're really happy to have Kearney from the Gleason Foundation joining us. And at, during the break, we were, and I was interested about some of the advocacy that, that you guys undertake. Uh, September was PAD Awareness Month. We're always trying to raise awareness for PAD. Kim does a great job um, with the weight of my heart, but it's it's under it's underrepresented and it's not on the radar, I guess, of you know mainstream uh, America. So, Kearney, what have you guys done to? Again, I, I don't know how many people have ALS. I'm, it's obviously less than those that have PAD, but clearly, you guys have been able to advocate both on probably local, regional, national levels and, and get some laws passed. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Um, our, our first was the Steve Gleason Act um, that allowed access to speech devices um, utilizing their eyes. Um, and that impacted everyone who has ALS that wants a speech device, they can get it right. It also impacts other diseases. It's not just for ALS. So it had a very large impact, which was really cool. Um, I, I feel what you're saying too, uh, John, is you know, ALS, it, they say on average at any given time has about 30,000 people with, with ALS at, in, in living, at least in the United States. Um, uh, and that, that it's, a, it's a disparity there. You know, we believe it could be a little bit more, um, but the unfortunate side of that is that there's a, a high death rate, um, unfortunately, um, being as a two to five year life expectancy there. So if you think about it in terms, it would be more than that. Um, but we feel that same situation when you start to kind of go up against, you know, some of the larger known diseases like heart disease or cancer or things of that nature, you're, you're fighting against dollars that are going to research for those things. Um, and so from our standpoint, we're also fighting against research. I don't want to say that because 
we don't want to fight against research. We would be happy to be out of a job tomorrow if that was the case, but we want to help people. And so, um, you know, my job being a fundraiser, being trying to raise revenue for us so that we can help more people. That's my goal um, to impact more people with ALS. Um, but we have had some, some great connections, some great people that have supported um, our foundation, Steve, um, in, in what he believes in, in his, as a leader in the ALS space of the needs for people to live with this, because that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to live and, and be with his family. He wants to do that for others as well. So that's kind of the premise there. That a lot more people, and I know for us, we always find that people are more apt to giving towards a large organization that is doing research where you don't see the dollars being used tangibly. Um, it's something that goes into a bucket in a sense and goes towards it. And maybe a few dollars out of that hundred dollars goes towards the research. The rest is for overhead and management and things like that. You know, how do you get people to shift their mindset to say, Hey, yes, well, research is great. You can see your money have a tangible, actionable impact with us and what we're doing. We're giving a communication device. Every dollar that we get from you goes to helping someone communicate, helping someone to be mobile, have a life, live a better quality of life. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, that's exactly what I say, right? It's like, you know, we, and we put it on our website, you know, the, the, the percentage of what goes back into the, the, the awards besides administrative um, expenses and things of that nature. Um, it's exactly right. I mean, other organizations, especially the large national ones, um, you're not exactly sure where those dollars are going. A lot of times they're helping and, and they're funding research and they're doing this and that. Um, you know where it's going. And you can, we have donors that say, I want to help specifically with technology or with uh, respite care. Um, or adventures. We have a whole adventures program that is similar to like Make a Wish, where we send ALS patients on adventures. We send them to Hawaii, we send them to Europe, Patagonia, and we we innovate different wheelchairs to make sure they can do different things, or beach wheelchairs, or different things like that. So um, it is sharing that. It is sharing the need um, and and broadening the scope a little bit. Um, we kind of created a, 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 I helped create a little partnership with a, a local hospital down here and it was part of their idea. We were more of a consultant, um, but they wanted some help in a technology for their sprain and spinal cord injuries, which is not ALS. And, um, we were able to consult with them and actually help some patients communicate with their doctors and their nurses in their outpatient service at that hospital with teaching them how to utilize these communication devices. So, you know, it's really neat to see, obviously, we're such an impact on the ALS community, what Team Gleason does, but it's there's a broader aspect. And that's where advocacy really comes into play, because you can impact. We try to say we are impacting about 35 percent of the ALS population currently. We want to we have a I'm starting a campaign. We're going to try to work towards raising more money to help more people to get to that 70, 80, 90, 100 percent of ALS patients, at least in the United States at this point. Um, but with advocacy, you pass a law that helps access, that's everyone. So it's, it's a much easier way, not that it's easy to do, but if it happens, you, you impact a large amount of people. What about so, with, you know, what about with the, the caregivers? We've spent the last couple of episodes talking about mental health and of the patient and also the family members. I mean, my dad has end stage Parkinson's and, and he needs almost 24 hour care. And it's really difficult and taxing uh, on my mom and the rest of my siblings. Absolutely. What do you, how do you guys cope with that or tackle that process? Yeah, it's a big part of what we do. And Michelle, Steve's uh, wife is a big component, component, component um, of it. He, she is, was his caregiver um, along with numerous others that helped her, but um, we wish we could do more, I think is where I'm going to start with that. As you know, caregiving is extremely expensive. Um, so what we do from our caregiving side, our, our, what we call our respite program is we do help provide support to caregivers, um, in a way, as much as we can, we have a budget for it and we have to try to stick within that budget. But yeah, I mean, just to your point, right. Helping a, a, a spouse who, you know, here's the challenge. Let me back up. Uh, someone with ALS, they lose their job probably because they can't function at that speed to do that. Well, then their spouse, in a lot of situations, that's who's going to be the caregiver. 
they have to stay home. They've lost two incomes and they're, that person is working around the clock to help their, their spouse. And so to give them 30 minutes, an hour to go to the mall or get a massage or whatever it is, get, have a hamburger alone uh, or with a friend from a mental health standpoint is incredibly valuable. Um, and we see that we've seen it firsthand because we work with caregivers every day with, with Steve and we know it. So um, yeah, that is a, uh, it's and part of that is, is hopefully, you know, getting Medicare to understand those things and we can increase those as well from a, from a caregiving perspective, from insurance and things that cover, because I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, it's an average, once you get that tracheotomy from an ALS standpoint, you're looking at a minimum of 200 to 250 a year because you need round the round the clock care. So and you're, 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 you know, parents are probably understanding to some degree of that with round the clock care. It's just extremely expensive. Yeah, it's a, obviously a devastating disease. Um, coming up after the break, we're going to continue our conversation about ALS and innovation around it. So please stay tuned. Medical Notepad, brought to you by Cardiovascular Systems Incorporated's patient advocacy campaign, Take a Stand Against Amputation, and patient advocacy organization, The Way to My Heart. In this week's Medical Notepad, how to be your best advocate. How do you get the best care? You need to learn to be your own best advocate. Hello, I'm Kim McNicholas, founder of patient advocacy organization, The Way to My Heart, with this week's Medical Notepad. When it comes to peripheral artery disease, or PAD, which is a chronic circulation issue that impacts mainly the leg arteries, the most impactful way you can be your own best advocate is to start collecting your records upon initial diagnosis. Every conversation, every test, every procedure, you want the doctor's notes and imaging. Some of this information may be provided in your provider's app or online portal, but images such as with ultrasound and angiography are not. You must request those to be put on a CD. It doesn't matter whether you have a CD player on your computer or not. A physician who could provide a timely second opinion will be able to view it on the CD. That's what's important. You can make the request for a copy of the images and the technician's notes the moment you check in for the imaging sessions. Some are able to give you a copy right after the session with only a verbal request, but most require that you make the request in writing by filling out a form, and it could take up to a week before you can pick it up or get it delivered to your home. Having all of your important records in your hands, not simply on an app or portal, empowers you with the critical health information you need to get the most timely, effective care possible across practices and facilities. With this week's Medical Notepad, I'm Kim McNicholas, founder of patient advocacy organization, The Way to My Heart. Remember that the advice and views offered in this Medical Notepad series are for educational and informational purposes only. Don't act upon any information provided here without the explicit consent of your own healthcare team. For more information on peripheral artery disease or PAD, go to standagainstamputation.com. And for real-time support, go to thewaytomyheart.org. Welcome back to The Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist, Kim McNicholas, and interventional cardiologist, Dr. John Phillips. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining us. During the break, we were kind of continuing our conversation about ALS, and I kind of joked that normally we have some levity in this show, and, and but this is a pretty heavy disease, and, and obviously it's difficult to wrap your arms around the fact that it's a, a life, a, you know, death sentence, and I'm, I'm in life ends for everybody, but obviously your life gets truncated pretty early. Kearney, you had mentioned during the break that sometimes you're dealing with the mental health aspect of patients who are in denial of this. Um, tell us a little bit about that and, and how the Gleason Foundation uses some innovation to help these people. Yeah, we try and we tell people, you know, this is where we're working with clinics and we're trying to get to work with even more clinics across the country so that we get to these patients 
early. So, because it, it makes a big difference in the technology that they need and the progressions, for understanding how it's going to work and what they'll need to move forward. Um, but yeah, it, it does. I mean, I, we work with people all the time about denial and like, no, let's get in ahead of time. Let's voice, let's bank your voice while you have it because it probably will go. You don't know when it's going to go, um, but it probably will. Um, and so having those isn't conversations. That what, isn't that what Steve did? Didn't he start making a video for his child? And then ultimately that turned. Correct. Into- so we have a documentary um, that Steve helped create and, and it's called Gleason. It's on Amazon prime. If, if any listeners want to go read it, do it with some tissues because it's pretty heavy, but you'll also laugh and, and smile. Um, but, you know, Steve has very low moments also even today, mm-hmm. you know, and he, and he shares them. He's very uh, social. So, you know, it's just a tough disease and you're just going to have moments from the beginning to the middle to the end um, where mental health is so, so impactful. And, and I'm sure Catherine, I'm sure that you, you, you understand that to some degree and, and have a lot more experience in it than I do. So. Yeah. You know, so, um, but basically, you know, with these pieces, I think there's a couple of things that you keep in mind um, or that people who have ALS, they keep in mind one, they, they probably go through the seven stages of grief. Like, um, and, you know, and that and that's a big part is the denial aspect and then eventually, you know, the acceptance part of it. But then with mental health, too, there's when people transition to different stages of life, that's when they have a higher chance of actually having mental illness. So, if you're, you know, when you retire or whatever else, your identity changes because that's your base. Right. So you've got to look at these people and they receive this diagnosis and they have two to five years. And it's so quick in the progression aspects. You know, if they do lose feeling in one part of their body, okay, well, they've adjusted to accept their identity that way. Well, now they're starting to lose their voice. So it's almost like they go through all these different changes in identity so quickly that, you know, sometimes it's just so overwhelming. It's hard for them to keep that desire to continue to be optimistic, you know, for a hope or for, for a cure. So that's something, you know, I think people just need to understand is that you'll, you'll go through the seven stages of grief, um, but then also, you know, your identity is going to change. So it's recognizing those changes in identity as you do progress. And that helps you to kind of keep a, a, a reference point there. Um, but, you know, one of the, some of the exciting things um, that are out there right now is, you know, with ketamine infusions, um, there are some approved protocols. There are some um, psychedelic studies that are in phase two trials uh, right now. They're having some really good results. So they're looking at it a little bit differently. You know, instead of it being more so of a nervous system, they're trying to look at actually, you know, are the receptors being overloaded? Um, is it, you know, some type of processing in the body to where it just can't filter out, you know, a lot of the acetylcholines and the parasympathetic systems. And is it just an imbalance of the system per se? So there is hope out there. Um, It's just, you know, it's scary. And I think that's a big piece is that people can recognize that and say, you know, it's scary. I may lose this. And then you're prepping for all these things at the end, you know, and it's horrible, but it's, it's good. But, you know, just to find the right support system. You know, to have people around you to where they can help to support you and then also have providers that don't see you as being too high acuity. I think that's a big piece is it's such a critical illness that it scares providers a lot of times. And, you know, we just have to be able to love and support love. each other. And I think that's so important. Also, you know, aside from mental health, it's it's really you know the physical health, the well being, you know, with with nutrition. And I um, want to get to dietitian Melissa because that's such a huge part, especially in advanced ages. So we're going to jump to break, and we're going to get back, and we're going to get to dietitian Melissa to talk about innovation around um, nutrition with ALS in just a moment. So stay with us. One in five Americans suffer from a mental disorder like depression, which was once a rare condition just 50 years ago. Why are more Americans anxious and stressed? We'll take a deep dive on October 26th for the future of mental and behavioral health. I'm Bambi Francisco Roizen. Join me and healthcare innovators from UCSF to Meta, the owner of Facebook, to explore how COVID exacerbated the mental health crisis and whether new tech solutions are working from digital therapeutics, teletherapy, faith-based apps, VR, and psychedelics. Join the conversation or just listen in from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Pacific time on October 26. Go to events.vator.tv to register. That's events.vator.tv. Welcome back to the Heart of Innovation, 
For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. So before we went to break, we were just kind of starting to touch on nutrition. And one of the things that a lot of these patients that have ALS lose control of is their ability for the small muscles to work in the esophagus and they need feeding tubes, right? And so, Kearney, tell us a little bit about what you guys do potentially with diet for these folks. And then, and then we have a dietitian here that can, can help us as well. So interested to hear what, what the newest thoughts are. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're very careful about, um, we have a diet plan that kind of Steve follows and Steve is his own unique individual. Um, and he has things that work for him and he, and he doesn't. So we will help share that with our patients, um, especially our specialists who are on our staff. We'll, we'll do those things. Um, you know, but I mean, you know, from a dietitian standpoint, you know, we have to be very careful on, on how we're, we're not dietitians, right? So we try to be very careful with how we give that advice. Um, but do you, yes. give any, do you guys give advice at all or no? Uh, we will give, um, we will share sometimes what Steve does um, and, and how he manages some of the things he eats and, and, and things of that nature that have worked for him. Um, there's a lot, you gotta be careful because there's a lot of out there that people have shakes and all these things that people will do. Um, and not, they all aren't, right for you um actually steve, oh my just gosh. Had a, steve just had an episode where he thought he was having pneumonia um they put him in the hospital which would be very bad for him um and when they diagnosed him when he got in there he had low sodium levels he was drinking too much water um yeah. and literally drowning i guess and uh he got out um within like two days and got that back on track he's like I, he says he's feel better in the last than he's felt in a year so it's really interesting, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure that a dietitian could speak more to it than I could. <laughs> yeah. Dietitian Melissa. Yeah, no, it is really a, a critical piece to support any kind of therapy and, and especially with ALS. Um, yeah, I've worked with a, a company where we would set up the patients on home nutrition support. And, you know, a lot of the, the patients you had mentioned, um, you know, sometimes they can still have things to eat and that's true because it's a progression. So, Usually, you know, you want to have a doctor who's going to be progressive in that sense to say, okay, if they're not able to take at least 80% of their calories by mouth, then it's probably time to go ahead and look at placing like a, a peg, which is surgically placed in the stomach area, um, uh, because that's where it's going to be the most useful for a long term. And, you know, and to your point too, you know, they, you want to be careful what you put in. I've seen people do all kinds of things where they're just blending up vegetables and putting that down the tube and, you know, vegetables are healthy, but, you know, you need to have, remember, this is the entire diet that they're going to be getting through that tube. So they do need to get all their uh, calories as well as protein, carbohydrate, fat, and all their, uh, you know, micronutrients like the vitamins and minerals as well. So they need to have a very holistic you know, liquid product, which is usually a medical grade product that we recommend to go into the tube. Um, and something else just I wanted to mention, I also worked with a lot of insurance to help get these patients set up. And when you're talking about Medicare, um, you know, they won't provide a pump. They don't cover pumps unless this is actually going into like the, a J tube versus a G tube. If it um, if it's a J tube, they have to have a pump. But um, I I've worked with a lot of doctors when they were setting their patients up, and you know they really wanted the patient to have the pump because maybe they don't have a lot of support or anybody to come by the home and and do the feedings with them. So um, just something to keep in mind. If it's a commercial pain insurance, typically they will do whatever the doctor wants. But if it's Medicare, they're very restrictive. They've got a limited pot of money that they you know provide for all the patients. So they won't do a pump of, unless it's a J2. Melissa, Sounds I have like to ask. Your next break. Oh, oh, sorry. I just have to ask, how do you make food fun for folks, whether they have ALS or whatnot, and they need a, a tube? A pig? And so a lot of what we do when we eat is so pleasurable and people really are passionate about food. How do you do that in situations? You have 20 seconds. 20 seconds. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> if, if, if they can't swallow anything and it's more of a risk for aspiration, then, you know, it, there's not a whole lot of room to, to run with making it fun. But, you know, if it's something like I have had people who just, you know, for treats been able to put like maybe, you know, melted ice cream down their, their tube just because that made them know that they were actually getting something liked. Thank you so much, Dietitian Melissa. Thank you so much to 
Catherine Walker with Revitalist and also Kearney Gray. We really appreciate what you're doing. If people want to find out more of what you're doing or if they want to donate or they have someone who needs help, where can they go? Yeah, teamgleason.org. And uh, you can go right on the website. You can find out all the information. If someone has ALS, they can they can have a list of things they can have. And then you can donate there as well. Perfect. Have a great day, everyone. Cardiologist, Dr. John Phillips. Our mission is to help patients live a better quality of life through comprehensive education, real-time support, and high-touch advocacy in partnership with thewaytomyheart.org and take a stand against amputation. Our purpose is to reduce the 1.5 million heart attacks and strokes and nearly 200,000 amputations annually. For more information regarding topics you've heard discussed on today's program, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. The Heart of Innovation is for educational and informational purposes only, and advice and views shared are not a substitute for medical advice from your own supervising physician. Do not act on any information provided in this show without the explicit consent from your own healthcare team. If you think you are having a medical emergency, call your local emergency number or go to the nearest hospital or emergency room.